Hello and welcome to a special series. I am here um, joined by Brian. Hello. I actually don't know how to say your last name because you said it real quick and it's it's a, it's a mouthful. It's Bucklew. Buck Bucklew. Bucklew, yeah. It's like a it's it's a Scottish name. Oh, nice. Actually, Buck Bucklew was Buck is Clue. the original. Like, what Clue is like a valley, so it's like deer. <laughs> Dear Valley, dude. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I, guess, I guess that counts as our first question. So um, this, we're going to be doing a, a, a small mini series here, and I'm going to be running a character that um, hopefully Brian will be able to uh, pick out for me here, and then I'll be uh, asking some questions, and we'll just be playing cut, and it'll be good. Should be. Sounds fun. Cool. So, um, this has most probably the most controversial question of this whole thing is, uh, do you want me to run a mutant or a true kin? I mean, I, I, when I actually play, which is, it isn't that, isn't that common. Um, <laughs> I usually play like a true kin tinker, um, just cause I don't, I don't like having a bunch of activated abilities, which may, may sound strange for someone who helped develop games of cud but that's that's just i don't like when i play when i play diablo or path of, I, I like to have like maybe two activated abilities and so like an esper or something just is not the kind of my, my kind of character i like to get like a big electrified sword or something and some gadgets so i usually i usually start as an artifacts okay um right artifacts and so you uh, if you're so you're you're probably you don't probably need that much intelligence because of your cast. Yeah, I usually I mean I usually will run a pretty balanced character because dumping anything too hard and cut is pretty bad. <laughs> so like usually I'll just run seventeens and eighteens across the board. Okay. Like um, a little bit of strength and a little bit of intelligence. Yeah, something like that. Something like this. Um, I usually dump Will, which often gets me into trouble. Um, but we'll see. Uh, what's your choice for for starting tech? Uh, I usually will take um, like what. There's one that's just one AV. Does that exist anymore? Translucent skin? Or no, that's that's, that's, that's DV. That's um, DV. Is there like a dermal <laughs> plating, or does that not exist? Like I'm I'm thinking of these old things. In that case, I might take um hand bones that's it's just such a good good ability you're you're basically building my favorite character here uh which I mean, is totally cool with me um where is it oh there it is carabite hand bones yeah. yeah there you go perfect all right i mean that, yeah that way we're good to go you know like we probably have to pick up a ranged weapon if we don't start with one um, I don't remember what the current starting gear for the artifacts is right now. Um, but once we, once we got a musket or a desert rifle, um, I think this character is pretty good to just dive in and, and start doing rust walls is usually how I start. Amazing. So, uh, I, I've, all, I've critically aired. I actually, I should have introduced like what, what your contribution or who you are as part of the caves of cud team. So why don't we start with that? Yeah. So I'm, I'm. One of the co-founders, alongside Jason Grimblatt, we grew up playing Caves of Cud, or not not playing Caves of Cud, but playing games together. Um, so we we played Dungeons and Dragons in my garage when we were teenagers. We played Gamma World. We actually started playing Gamma World because my family was a very religious family, and Dungeons and Dragons was banned because it was demonic. But Nobody knew what Gamma World was, so it was not banned. So we spent a lot of our early years playing games like Rifts and Gamma World. Um, and though later Dungeons and Dragons, we pl we played a lot of. Um, and we discovered pretty early on, like in the mid-90s, these big narrative campaigns that had very little combat. And we we're like, wow, this is a pretty interesting way to play these RPGs. Nowadays, it's that's that's sort of like a well-known way, way to play. But in like 1994... It was less so. We kind of stumbled into that kind of like pure storytelling mode. And our love for these big story-driven games and games like R Weird Worlds, like Rifts and Gamma World, 
um, eventually led us to make a bunch of stuff um, that never got released. And eventually, the, some of the settings we worked on came together with a roguelike engine I was working on and um, sort of turned into Caves of Cud. I'm primarily a technician, um, and Jason does uh, like the lore and the design design work, though we, we both you know do do parts of all jobs. Um, and so for quite a long time, it was just me and Jason working on Caves of Cud. Um, though nowadays we have like quite a big team relative to just us working after hours. All right. Well, um, I think I've got my first bug here. I'm not actually able to fire my <laughs> bow. Let me double check. I've got my impulse. Yeah, yeah. Let me check, check that it's mapped correctly. Um, that actually answers quite a few of my questions, but now I've got some interesting follow-ups. But uh, let me see if I can fix this first. Missile weapon menu. Is that... That'd be it. Missile weapon menu. It's been a while since uh, I've had to... No, it should just be fire missile weapon. Um, fire missile weapon. Under adventure. You can just search for it. Oh, yeah. I often forget. Uh, Narf is new. constantly reminding me that yeah. control F. It should be F. Uh, yeah, it's possible I broke it. Missile, fire missile weapon is there. Yeah. Uh, let's save. Let's see what happens. Nope. Unless okay, I Okay, so critically unmap made. fire. Uh, go go back and just reset your binds to default. And let, do you have anything like I, I, wild I have, that would? I've actually already done that recently. Um, but let's let's try. It. Yeah, let's do same. it. Do it now after that. Nope. Nice. Interesting. Let me, I'll deploy a turret instead. You have no missile weapons to deploy. Oh, yeah. Can we do a short bow turret? I've never actually messed around with deploying turrets at all. I feel like you're not on the actual latest. All right, I'm going to do a quick pause. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. Apparently you can deploy a, a short bow turret and that, that worked quite well. Um, but I'm going to do a pause in the recording and we'll see, I'll see if I can sort this out. All right, we're good now. Um, right. So <laughs> that that was odd. Um, and it has completely thrown me for a loop here. Let me see. All right. So um, here's here's my intro question is uh, what are your chickens names? Um, boy, that's a good question for my daughter. She has a few names for them. I'm I'm I mostly call them rooster and their color. <laughs> that they 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 have often in the past um gotten eaten every couple years because there's a ton of predators out here. Um and so we rotated we, through them. We had to, we've had several long lived ones that earn names, right? Like so so eventually they've they've become canny enough to get get names like Mama Genny and Chick Chicky and Nugget um and Oreo and Red. Um but we've got a big rooster. We got a big rooster as a as a chick shipment. Usually we don't have a rooster, but we just kept this one. Um because he was big and cool looking. But he's done a good job keeping the flock alive. Um he's fought off a couple predators. He'll end up kinda ruffled in the morning or off in the off in the weeds because he he fought something and is hiding now um but we haven't we haven't lost a chicken since he's been around so now you got me now you got me wondering like what kind of predators do you have to watch out for for keeping chickens um so around here you got raccoons you got feral dogs you got coyotes you got fox you have hawks and owls um, and possums, possums won't, will eat the eggs and usually won't attack the chickens. Um, big ones, raccoons will just come every night and have chicken dinner. Um, oh, geez. and you can, you can tell what's killing the chickens. This may be a little gruesome for stream, but you can tell what's ki killing the chickens by the state of their, their corpse. Um, cause raccoons will often just take the head. Um, like a bird strike looks different than, uh, a dog, a dog or a coyote will usually take the chicken and shake it so there'll be feathers all over. Whereas like a fox will just grab the thing and run. Um, and like a, often an owl will strike the bird and it looks like a, I've seen I've seen an owl strike on a chicken. 
um, and it just explodes like a <laughs> missile hit it. You don't see you don't see anything, right? Like they're completely silent and just just like a drone strike, the chicken explodes in a puff of feathers, and there's a giant ass owl sitting on it. Um, and they'll often just eat eat the corpse, right? They'll eat it right there. Um, and and then leave, and so you just look. It looks like a missile hit your chicken when it's an outstrike. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff out here that I mean, chickens are delicious, and they're not that smart, and so <laughs> it, it is it's just a it's a tough life for a chicken in the <laughs> wild. Jeez, I um yeah, I, I've seen uh, videos. I know that owls are basically like the quietest pred birds. Um, yeah, they're basically silent in flight. So hard, hard to content, hard to honestly give the chicken much of a hard time for um, failing to contend with that. Oh, they're just they're not smart animals in general. <laughs> they're 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 really domestic. I mean, they're like they they're they're dumb like a bird, but they're not like guinea guinea fowl, which we also keep are wild. They're a little more canny. They'll sleep up in trees at night if they're out. Chickens will just I mean, they're basically like a dumb little dog. And so they'll just like sit on the porch and let the something will come eat it. Um, which is like surprising. I think I grew up as a city kid, and 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 ch how how domesticated domesticated animals are was a little surprising to me. Like chickens are just, they'll just sit in your lap. They'll come and get scraps under the table, like a like any kind of other domestic pet. Um, yeah, so that's 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 chickens' life. It's pretty it's pretty good. The downside of having a rooster is that the the eggs are fertilized, and so you can't you. Under normal circumstances, you can pick up the eggs just sort of during the week, and it's fine. But if you've got a rooster, you've got to really get at them the day they're laid um, and get them in the fridge if you don't want them to be gross, because they will just have chi chickens in them. Whereas uh, if you don't have a rooster, they don't. They're, they're unfertilized eggs. You can just pick up whenever. Have you ever had, a, like, a close call? With what? Well, like, you, you're making breakfast, and it's like, oh. Oh, there's... yeah. Of course. If you got fertilized eggs, I mean, it's it's like, oh, well, there, that was... That was one we missed, and now there's a chicken in it instead. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm just seeing how much, how far I can push my luck here with uh, not asking cud-based questions. Uh, so through the gambit, um, how many animals do you have? Um, uh, both got, like domesticated and like also uh, stock. We have we have a Saint Bernard dog. We have currently four cats between wow. 16 and four years old we have three domestic rabbits we have i don't know we have two guinea fowl and we have seven adult chickens and a new brood of chicks that were laid this year from this rooster we have 10 of them that the chickens successfully hatched and are now in in chicken raising storage just a cage in the coop um, I've, I've, have, sorry go ahead and and then uh i live on 30 acres out here so we have wild rabbit and foxes and all the things that eat the chicken um lo lots of red-winged blackbirds and swallows this time of year wow so um i have i have wondered for keeping chickens like if you get a you know like a a, a nice uh input of eggs i don't know how to put it not strange you get a good you get a good laying breed which most of them are i mean most of them are bred to be domestic egg producers um the ones that aren't meat chickens um so if you get like a any kind of like a buff warpington um you'll get an egg a day per chicken and so like is it just like viable or is it something um do you you just you just consider like all eggs that you get as like okay well those are just a bunch of new chickens or like how many um, do you like do you, they, do you have it like a spreadsheet for like how many chickens percentage wise I do not no I do not I do not care about the business of my chicken raising so they like during the summer now they just they just lay them in nests and they will they get broody um the female chickens uh which means that they spend their whole day just sitting on the nests and so we go in once a day and see if any of them have hatched and only a, a, a relatively modest portion of them hatch. Um, some of the eggs are too... They don't really even care about the babies that much. They just like sitting on the eggs. Um, and so they'll just often kick the kick the babies out who are walking around the coop. 
um, while the hens sit on the sit on the clutches of eggs. And then occasionally you go in and remove all the eggs that have been in there for so long that they're probably not going to fertilize. Okay. Then then they will fill them up again and you'll get new ones. But we're not like trying to maximize our production, so we're just kind of like letting them sit rooty on the eggs and picking up the feet because we don't have room for. 300 chickens right like yeah but... <laughs> and we 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 are fine if they produce eight or nine you know not all of them will make it to adulthood the birds are pretty fragile some of them get eaten so th yeah that's like the thing like you know if i was going to keep livestock i've often wondered like uh, how many am i you know of these am i reserving for um you know basically making new chickens um, yeah, I mean, it just, I mean, you only need a hen and a rooster to make more chickens, though you probably want a little more genetic diversity than that. Uh, chickens are pretty easy. They they just kind of eat anything. You know, phrases like for the birds, I mean, <laughs> you just take any garbage you want and throw it out and the birds will eat it. Um, they they like corn. I actually they didn't know that's okay. I didn't know that's where that phrase came from, actually. Oh, you'll find you'll find a lot of things make a lot of sense, like the Easter egg hunt, where after winter you haven't been picking up the eggs, but the chickens will still lay them, and you gotta you gotta go clean out all the old eggs in spring when you want to start collecting them. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's a mystery <laughs> solved. Uh huh. So how how did uh, ye old Jeebus get get in that picture? Uh, well. <laughs> That, that it's a it's a it's a pagan fertility um season right right and so these that's a season when traditionally there are rituals around rebirth right which is, a, is spring right they, there's there's baby chickens so you got chicks there's baby rabbits right like all those things are starting to pop up um chickens and rabbits are are very fertile so those are all fertility symbols um, from those old pagan rites. And so if you want a place to situate a rebirth uh, uh, holiday, like Easter is, um, then that makes a lot of sense because everyone's already going to be celebrating a vernal rebirth uh, celebration. So you just re kind of rebrand it. Um, so you don't have to force anyone into new new situations. And so that's why you get a, a rebirth ceremony in spring. Nice. Similar to why Christmas is is at the the the, uh, the winter when like the the darkest night of winter, right? Like that also was a pre existing festival. I knew I knew that festival one. Time. I didn't uh, yeah. I didn't expect to understand how Easter worked, but that probably shows my ignorance more than. Uh the the value of, of like that trivia yeah, mo necessarily most of the most of those like european christian traditions are just repurposed pagan pagan holidays um cuz like if you're trying to convert a whole population it's much much easier to to piggyback on existing um holiday traditions than it is to like completely refactor and pick new days right i do you appreciate the idea of just like like you know we're just going to rebrand it We'll call it family day. Yeah. Oh, it totally, it totally is that, right? Uh, oh, we got a rebirth ceremony. Where do we go? Well, uh, let's let's take over the 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 festival of renewal that already exists, right? Uh, the, the, we're celebrating actually Jesus's rebirth instead of the rebirth of of spring, right? Or we're doing both. So that that would appeal to especially early pagan populations that didn't want to ditch their their whole their whole thing. Um, have you played Pentiment? It engages uh, quite quite a bit with 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 this, and I think it actually is relevant to Caves of God because Caves of God is a lot about um, sort of hi historic layering and the kind of changes that happen over time. So you know, yeah, if you're interested in that kind of thing, I would really recommend checking out Pentiment, which engages with the like mid 1500s um, conversion of populations from sort of pagan era traditions to Christian traditions and the way that layering happens. Anyway, it's really compelling. I um I haven't played Pentiment yet, but it was on my it's on my list and um I will probably be playing it at some point this year. It's and it's, been a, it's, like it's a, a little more fun than game. it's than it seems on the package because it's actually a murder mystery. And so 
all of all the historical stuff is great and interesting, but it's also like just kind of a fun murder mystery too. Uh, so if it's putting you off playing the sort of historically situated game, you could sort of come at it purely from a murder mystery adventure game angle. I wouldn't say the theming put me off, but I was a little intimidated because I saw a lot of like clearly historians saying like, this game's great. I finally have a game that, you know, gets it right. I was like, yeah. am I only going to appreciate way. this if I have like a... Yeah, yeah. Bachelor's? And then I got into it and I was like, oh, okay, I'm playing a fun murder mystery. That's that's good. I, I'll enjoy that that part of it. Nice. All right. Well, um, I think if I uh, delay any longer, um, someone's going to get really pissed off with me. Um, so uh, besides Gamma World, um, what is a large source of influence for you when designing CUD? Um... Well, we were just talking about one of them, which is both Jason and I have like a, a a long set of shared interest in sort of global history, as well as like going back to cosmology. So it's like rooted not only in the cultural history, but also the physical history of the universe. And you see that shared interest set reflected in CUD, where we expo explore both sort of the cultural layering of history and, and also the sort of existential cosmic under 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 threading of the universe um so like when it you know come to the like like this to me always felt like the subtext of like you know under caves of cud a layer cake of history you you meant you mean it like literally and all the way back, forward. right? All, all the way back to the singularity at the start of time, right? Like history isn't just the human history, right? Like the with human history is deeply layered, but it's sitting on top of literally geologic layers. Geologic layers are sitting on top of cosmological substrate, right? Like all those layers inform the current moment of of time, both in the world and in Caves of Cud. Um, and then we, we both also, Jason more than me, maybe, but all, all re really enjoy very literary sci-fi stuff like Canical for Leibowitz and Gene Wolfe and Dune. Um, and so those elements of inspiration also make it in, in the form of Jason's like very literary writing. Um, I recently, I, I, you know, I don't don't mean to but uh, i will definitely come across your tweets on uh talking about different um stuff but like gene that's shadow of the torturer right yeah yeah the book of the new sun book of the long sun i mean there's tons of stuff um and this was kind of uh jason calls it a retroactive influence it's 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 something that we didn't we we didn't know gene wolf until long after we had built caves of cud and it was released but it was clear once we found Gene Wolf that he was tapping a lot of the same sort of cosmic flows of creative energy, right? He's he's like a really amazing literary author that's that's using science fiction to talk about culture and religion and sort of meaning in life and all those things. Right. Um, so it's like, um, you, I guess you're you're talking about like sort of like the idea that um or the theming of like uh it feels medieval or feudal but it's actually like the far future yeah yeah it's it's a it's it's post-apocalyptic but one of the things you learn quickly when you are a real student of history is that civilization falls apart all the time we're we're in the post-apocalyptic future of a thousand civilizations and cultures. And so it's not a world like Fallout where things have decayed the end. It's a it's just another world, another burgeoning world birthed on top of old layers. And that's the same as our culture, right? I mean we, we like to think People like to think of their culture as sort of like the final pinnacle of cultural evolution and not think too much about the stuff that's happened before. But in reality, we're just yet another culture, sort of with our roots in the deep hummus of the bodies of a thousand cultures before us. And, and the world of cut is no different. It's just 
yet again sometime in the in the distant future. I died. <laughs> yeah. It happens. No, uh, that, that that I got uh, um, scavenger with a stun rod. Happened to find a, a, a nice little trinket. I mean, that's a nasty surprise. That is a nasty surprise. Got it at Easter. Found it amongst the eggs. <laughs> um, okay, I'm trying Rust Wells instead. Now that I'm back to level one. Jeez. Um, yeah, so I guess that, that kind of neatly brings me to... Uh, you recently actually redesigned... Well, not you. I, 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 um, I guess I should, um, for the sake of the audience or viewership like you know um rephrase i know that you are you and jason are not really um soul the soul kind of core of cut and i was going to ask about this a little bit later um but like you you've become now quite um like a team a group of of many different minds contributing to like a kind of a hot pot of uh yeah the, the, the team is quite big now so uh, I guess I, I just want to be a bit more specific. If I say like you or I'm referring to something that you design, um, it's more mostly because you're here now and I know it's like most sure. of what is in cut is attributed to many people now. And I want to be respectful of that. Um, so um, with it in, in mind, uh, Red Rock and Russ Wells both got like pretty hefty redesigns. I mean, it was about a year ago now. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I'm just curious about like what led to that. Um, like, was it something you always like, Oh, like, um, you know, maybe when you started cud, you always had it in mind to like make rust wells a bit more interesting or a bit more intricate. Um, it's, it's, it's mostly that the game has been in development a long time. Um, our design skills have improved a lot in the. 15 or so years since we built it and dungeons like rust wells and red art rock were essentially proof of concepts built by us you know going on two decades ago um and were relatively low hanging low hanging fruit for improvement and areas that are visited by most players the most often and so having them be um in that sort of like very nascent state where they felt like ancient roguelikes, both in their look and the way you played, um, people would come into the game and not really understand that it's different than other roguelikes until they get to Golgotha. Right. Uh, and we thought what we wanted to do was was show people earlier that Caves of Cud has something different to bring to the table and do that early in these first couple dungeons and do it, you know, leverage our, our modern design strengths. Um, they didn't have to be super elaborate, but we wanted to showcase the world more than the very old dungeons did. And we could do it relatively quickly um, because our technical and design skills are much, much, much stronger than they were when we laid those dungeons out forever ago. And so we spent a few weeks giving them a modern facelift, giving the Red Rock some interesting encounters, making the Rust Wells sort of a physically interesting um, and diverse location. And that kind of answers uh, you know, like I think, three or four I, of my follow-up questions. <laughs> yeah, and so, you know, I think the results were, were pretty good, especially for the amount of time that we had to spend on it, which wasn't a huge amount of time. Yeah, no, um, when you started teasing the update for Rust Wells, it was actually like one of my most like looked forward to like feature updates for cud um mostly because i had never like seen that kind of um representation of like verticality in any traditional roguelike or at least not many and certainly not in cud yet um so it was just like a it was a whole new ball game um that i was yeah, really looking pretty fun to. i wish i wish we, we've got a long lit litany of things that we could put in, you know, world encounters, you know, just just tons of stuff. But we're really leaning in, trying to ship 1.0 at this point. So we're being pretty, pretty ruthless with what kind of frivolity makes it in, just so we can finally land a real release of the game. After that, though, um, I'd, I'd like to continue building on it. Okay. Get some of that stuff that we've wanted to, to get into the game forever, get it in over time. 
that actually is uh it's touching somewhat on um some stuff i was gonna bring up probably near the end of this like small series but uh, i'm i'm glad you did um but i think on that note it's just the half an hour mark so i'm actually gonna end this and then we'll uh we'll continue with it and uh, we'll, we'll go into maybe a bit more uh influences because i'm i'm interested in that um maybe a bit more of the specifics like uh i know there's like some some specific items that are like i've always wondered like what where is this and um maybe some story stuff sure. but, um so uh and thank you very much for for joining me and um also you know people watching this if you're looking forward to more you can hit the like and uh, the comment and all that stuff and yeah and uh we'll uh We'll continue. We'll pick this up in the next episode. Um, do you have anything you want to add, add to the end of this? No, it's been fun. Looking cool. forward to the next one. All right. See you soon.